Alright, thank you and welcome. Today we are going to look at, uh, we want, want to do small Bible study. Uh, I will plead with you ahead of time to, please, if you, if you really love Christ and you love the truth, I would love you to share this video. Many will not want to watch this video. They may not look at it because it is probably not carrying a caption that they, they, uh, describes gossip. So many will not want to watch it. But if you are seeking for the truth and you love the Lord Jesus, please, I'd like you to share this video because a lot is happening in the body of Christ as we speak now. Many people that are not of Christ have invaded the church and they are destroying the church with false doctrine. So, we want to look at a certain aspect of such teachings in the church. And... Uh, the Lord will help us to balance it. And I would like you to, I will encourage you to tag along with us, endeavor to at least watch um, to a certain level of viewership because uh, messages like this, the beginning might be boring to you, but uh, the end or the middle of the message, that is where you may actually get uh, what it is all about so i plead with you to like it share it and if at the end of time we have up to a thousand viewership on this one and maybe a hundred like uh we will come back with another bible study that will talk about you know born again you know we have the teachings of today that false teachers are teaching people that um once you are born again you are born again forever okay i uh, i don't have an opinion of mine based on that but the scriptures have enough to teach us whether persons who were born again yesterday can possibly remain born again today you know if there is anything like eternal salvation if there is anything like eternal security once you're born again you remain born again i would like to bring that to us but it will give me joy okay to see that you helped me advertise this video and the lord will bless you in the name of jesus christ amen so shall we pray our father in glory will bless your name we thank you father for the opportunity you've given to us in this life that day that we might have access to the word of truth. Father, today we have come that you might use us by the Spirit to rightly divide this word of truth. Our Father in heaven, there are many that have been confused and those that have been deceived. I ask, O oh God, that through this you are going to deliver many and put many back to the path of righteousness and the truth in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, our Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Once again, you are welcome in Jesus' name. Today, we are going to actually look into series uh, quotations from the Bible. So, we are going to read long. I wish that this message would be very short, but I really cannot guarantee that. So, let's move on. Uh, we are going to look at uh, the faith, our faith. And works as it has to do with the belief of today that many have been told that uh, once they hear people talk about them taking care of how they live and how they speak and when you tell a fellow Christian to dress well you will hear many tell you that you are being legalistic when you when you try to caution a believer that is using foul language she will tell you you're being legalistic. When you tell a believer that things he allows in, things that goes in and things that come out of him or her uh, goes a long way to determine his relationship with the Lord, he will term you a religious person and then will immediately brandish the scripture that says that for by works shall no man be saved. 
but by grace and that if our faith in Christ is and you know um, is valid enough is strong enough that that is okay I've got no argument with those ones without our faith in Christ we shall not be saved and nobody actually has been saved or will ever be saved by works but does faith nullify works uh, we will find out from the scripture so let us go quickly to Galatians chapter 2 we'll be reading verse 16 and 21 Galatians chapter 2 verse 16 and verse 21 so I read um, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law but by the faith of Jesus Christ even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. I stand again to say that by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Okay, let's talk about verse 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Well, wonderful. These scriptures are true. Nothing can be added to these and nothing can be deducted from it. But the truth is that no scripture is capable of private interpretation and so we have read two verses that spoke about our salvation being hinged on the faith now so we want to look at the words the root words we look at justify first we look at justify first now the word justify the root word there the greek word there is dekaio dekaio and this has to do with to be freed, to be made righteous, to be freed, to be made righteous. That is the word justify. And you look, another word we look at in the verses we read from, you look at work. And the Greek word for work is ergon, ergon, that typifies work, deed, labor doing now when you you want to talk about these things we'll come back to them but you you that doing the labor also includes our deeds and our religious activities these are works now and the last word that we need to talk about there now is faith faith and the greek word there is pistis pistis that has to do with persuasion credence your moral conviction of righteous truth or truthfulness of God or even your conviction of a religious teacher especially that teaches reliance upon Christ for our salvation now when we put this thing together now the question we need to ask here is does this verses and chapters I mean does these verses or do these verses apply to the believer what was the incident that took place before Apostle Paul came up with these uh, scriptures that he put down here now we need to understand that he was writing to the church and the brethren in this church were before this time believers in Christ Jesus who were purged from the conscience of sin and they were already believers and acting and doing walking in the spirit of the Lord in the spirit that gave them salvation until certain individuals crept in and began to diffuse their faith and infusing the doctrine of man and I will add the doctrine of Satan now by inferring that these believers in Christ, that their salvation would not be complete, that their faith 
was not enough to save them, except the you know the the come back to do some of the ceremonial laws of the Jews, things like circumcision. And so Apostle Paul and I came in, and at some point he was asking them, "Oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you?" So here, uh, it is very important we note that nobody ever has been saved and shall be saved or will ever be saved by his work. So the apostle here was dealing with a very sensitive issue, a very sensitive matter that has to do with the sinner. So Paul deals here with the question of how sinners can be justified. You know, how can they be forgiven their sins? How can it be if they have accepted God? Was that enough? So, you know, how they can come into right relationship with God? Now, this will happen, not by works. You get to understand that. No, no sinner is saved by his work because no work of any man is good. The Lord Jesus told us that no man is good. So that is quite understandable. So nobody has achieved this by the works of the law, but by a living faith in Christ Jesus. So it then means that uh, you cannot be saved by your work. You, can, you will be saved by your faith. Now, but where we have problem now is that some persons who claimed to have been saved, they have already been saved. But they tell you that their faith is enough. So when they live in sin, they want to tell you that their faith in Christ Jesus was enough to cover their sin. And I, I listened to one of these false prophets in South Africa uh, who was talking about the sin of the people being hidden under the blood. And so he told them, well, you said your, your own sin is hidden under the blood. I keep it for you under the blood. Now, there is no scripture that supports that our sins are kept under the blood. The blood of Jesus is capable enough, strong enough to cleanse us from every unrighteousness. And once we are cleansed, we are expected to be up and doing. So I want to, you know, bring to the knowledge of who is washing me now or you that are washing me now that your faith alone, your faith alone, your faith was necessary for your salvation in Christ Jesus. But that faith alone cannot guarantee your, your continuity in relationship with Jesus Christ. Your faith alone brings you to Jesus, but that faith alone cannot keep you in Jesus. Your faith alone uh, was, your faith was enough to grant you salvation, to grant you access to the, the family of the Lord. But once you come into the family of the Lord, there is an expectancy from you. There is something that is expected of the Lord from you. Because you are coming into, into an economy that is quite different from where you are coming from. And once you come into this civilization, there is a principle. There is a precept. There are people who are, who are members and citizens of this country. Now it is quite understandable that the laws that are applicable in Nigeria may not be applicable in South Africa and that which is workable in South Africa may not be applicable in, in, in America and that that is workable in America even as close as Canada and the uh, US, United States of America are, they may not be operating the same laws. And so if you, if you carry your mentality of the laws that is workable in your country, maybe in Nigeria here, and you move to Benin Republic very close, and you want, to, you want to live with the mentality of the laws of that your country in another country, you will run into trouble with that country. Now, so your faith is like the visa that grants you access into the country that was not your country of birth. And so your faith as the visa does the work and remember that, you know, for you to stay, you know, continuously, for you to remain in that country, your visa must be up and running. You don't live in a, another man's country with an expired document, with an expired visa. So in as much as 
your visa is important your observation observance of the laws of the country that is giving you a, a shelter is equally important and here comes the joke let us look at james chapter 2 verse 14 we will read now remember we had discussed about we have talked about ergon which is the work and pistis which is your faith your credence now your conviction your moral conviction now a lot of people uh, get these things wrong when they talk about that the, the you know the death of jesus has nullified the laws of moses and i want you to understand here clearly that jesus our Lord, my Lord, your Lord, our Savior, the King. I love him so much because he has never told us lies. He said he has not come to abrogate. Uh, he has not come to destroy. He has not come to nullify. He has not come to set aside the law. Rather, he came to fulfill the law. And in fulfilling the law, he fulfilled certain ritualistic observances and... and, uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, rituals that were itemized in the Old Testament. He came and he fulfilled those ones and in doing that he was able to set those ones aside. But there are the laws that he did not set aside in the sense that he fulfilled them by observing them and setting for us an example whereby we must work. And so we go to James chapter 2 verse. We'll be reading verse 14 first. And it says, uh, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and hath no works, can faith save him? This is a question here. Apostle James, Apostle James, and this James here, uh, we believe, is the, the Lord's brother. And so he is asking, he said, what doth it profit, my brethren? So I ask you, my brother, my sister, you may have been told, you may have been brainwashed, you may have been convinced by a false teacher that all you needed was that faith that brought you to Jesus Christ and every other thing would be taken care of under the blood. And so you live your life carelessly and when they tell you about your work, you simply retort that your work cannot take you to eternity. Now the Bible says here, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? Now, it is important we know that the same Greek word that was used in Galatians chapter 2, verses 16 and 21, the same root word for faith and for works are the same one that are used in this faith and work. So the word for faith here remains pistis. And we talked about pistis as, as your persuasion, your credence, your moral conviction of religious truth or the truth, truthfulness of God, even that from a religious teacher, especially reliance upon Christ for salvation. So uh, the definition remains the same. The root word remains the same, pistis. And the work here, because somebody may tell me now that the work that Apostle James is talking about here is the work of helping people, the work of, no, it is part of it. This is not... This is not exclusive to that work of philanthropy. Okay, so it is your ergon and your pistis. Now, so the apostle here is questioning, how does it make sense? How does it relate? How do they, you know, uh, 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 how can somebody say that without work, his faith stands? Then he, 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 he is asking a question, what is your profit, my brother? Though you say you have faith and do not have work. Now, this is looking like somebody who says he has an engine, a vehicular engine, but then that is just all that he has. There is no body for the engine. Now, it's somebody, like somebody that says, I have a gun, 
but I don't have the gun is not having a trigger. Now this cannot officiate, this cannot work rather. Now it's like when you say you have an air conditioner, maybe split unit, and you have the, the, the inner unit, the, the in-room unit intact, but the outdoor unit you don't have. Now these two are one, though they are separate, uh, you know, separable physically, but in working relationship, you cannot separate one from the other. So, works and faith, ergon and pistis are, you know, interchangeably together. Now, you see, the truth is that faith makes the workings of righteousness alive. If you don't have faith in Christ, you cannot be saved. Now, if you have been saved in Christ, now that faith in Christ makes uh, your work of righteousness to be given birth to. Uh, in the same place where we are reading James chapter 2, we read from, from verse uh, 17 now, even so, faith. Okay, let's take it from verse uh, 15. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be you warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Verse 18 says, Yea. A man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Here are two people. One says he has faith, but he doesn't have work. He has faith, he doesn't have character. He has faith, he doesn't have moral conscience. He is not morally conscious. He has faith, he lives in fornication. He has faith, he lives in drunkenness. He has faith, he lives in adultery. He has faith, he gives bribe and takes bribe. He has faith, he's an armed robber, he's a thief. She has faith, she, she jumps from one bed to the other. She has faith, but she is keeping a boyfriend, you know, relationship, same partners, you know, because you can actually have a friend that is of an opposite sex and they can keep it platonic. So when I say boyfriend and girlfriend, um, somebody may misunderstand me, but I'm talking about this in the sense wherein it is. It has become that the two of you are living in sexual immorality. Now, there is a, a very wonderful quote that somebody released, Reno Mockery. He said that he is not sympathetic to any girl who is crying of, of being heartbroken that her boyfriend, uh, you know, was or is cheating on her. Now, he said, as far as he is concerned, and I put myself there, as far as I'm concerned, your boyfriend, your girlfriend cannot cheat on you. The both of you are cheating God. The only time you can cry of cheating from your partner is if the two of you are married together. So you cannot say that somebody you're not married to, you're not, you know, you're, that is not your husband, is not your wife, is cheating on you. It is the two of you that, so since you engage in premarital sex, you are cheating God. You are, you are, you are insulting God. So now, but we have so many, so many believers in quotes. They have faith. They've been born again. Jesus has saved them. They've confessed their fault at the foot of the cross. Now this is. You know, um, the withering that somebody will come to Jesus, he confessed fornication at the foot of the cross. He confessed lying at the foot of the cross. He confessed stealing at the foot of the cross. He confessed all kinds of sins at the foot of the cross. And Jesus, you know, looked down, picked him up. And suddenly, you know, this same person comes into the fold and goes back just like the dog who goes back to his vomit. And then when you tell this person you are not living right, he tells you, I have my faith in Jesus. My faith in Jesus is enough. No, your faith in Jesus isn't enough. Your faith is in Jesus isn't enough. The apostle here is asking you, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. In other words, he is saying that, your faith, of course he said so, that your faith without works is dead. And my faith is justified 
by my work. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But without no, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. Now, when you have faith and you don't have the works to uh, match it with, your faith is like that of the devils. Your faith, you know, uh, is dead on arrival. It's just similar to that of the devil because you believe in God and the devil believes that there is God. His demons believe that there is God. The devil believes that there is God. His demons believe that there is God. You, you believe that there is God. But you are not giving God honor as God. Hence, you are not producing the fruit that is commensurable or commensurate with your faith. And John the Baptist told the people, produce fruit that is worthy of your repentance. You don't just come out and say you repented. You don't just come out and claim that you're born again. You don't come out and just say that you, you have faith in Christ. But then, there is no work to differentiate from who you are. And continuing in our reading, he says in verse 21, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Now, so I said earlier that faith makes the workings of righteousness alive. And that we have seen in James chapter 2 verse 18. Now, so, uh, are we not saying that is Apostle Paul and James, are they contradicting themselves far be it no way they are not in Romans chapter 2 verse 13 Romans chapter 2 verse 13 we see what Apostle Paul wrote Apostle Paul wrote that Abraham his his uh, approval of God was faith not work seems like that was what he wrote but James here said that it was work, I think, I guess I should read, finish that, verse 21 of James chapter 2, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? 22 says, seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. So he is not denying the faith of Abraham here, but he said, Abraham believed it was his faith that spurred him into doing what he did. And so, well, if he had faith alone and then he didn't believe, he didn't, he didn't go on to act, you won't be reading that here. So, he was saying here, or he is saying here, Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Verse 24 says, See, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Not by faith only. Now, verse 24, he gave us another, uh, verse 25, he gave us an, another example of a person who manifested faith in his work, in her work. Likewise also, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. As a vehicle without an engine is dead, so faith without works is dead. Rahab, Rahab had faith in, in, in the things, in the God of Israel. And in spite of the fortification of Jericho, where she lived, she had faith in what God was about to do through the children of Israel. And so he aligned her faith, you know, in God and produced the fruit of the faith by working out the safety and the escape of the people. And so this was reckoned unto her for righteousness. And no wonder she, she you know, she was inducted into the, you know, uh, uh, the, the faith hall of fame of the saints and believers. And she became one of the grandmothers of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so in Romans chapter 2, you know, verse uh, 13, the Bible said there, and I read, For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. 
and we talked about justification that the root word for justification is to be made free to be freed to be made righteous to have no sin imputed on us now if apostle paul is talking against work here or talking against the law here then this verse 12 should be or this verse 13 of Romans chapter 2 should be set at naught but he said for not the hearers of the law are just before God but the doers of the law shall he did not say was or where because some of us hold the law uh, uh, in the past that everything about the Old Testament is past. So, but Apostle Paul says here, the doers shall be justified. Shall be justified. He didn't say that those that did the law were justified, but that the doers shall be justified. In other words, he's encouraging you to pay attention to the, you know, the, the contents of the moral laws of God. Remember that what Moses came down from the mount with was the commandments of God and these were parts of the law. And so as I said earlier on that there were some uh, ritualistic ordinances that the death of Jesus took out of the way. But there were those that can never ever be taken out of the way because those are the form, the standard, the basic standard of our relationship with the Lord. So, Romans chapter 2 verse 13, when the hearers of the law, through their conviction, their pistis, you know, do the work of the regulation prescribed, nomos, then shall they be justified. Then shall they be justified. Read and praise the Lord. Now, when we talk about the law, the law, the root word for law is the Greek word nomas. Nomas. And this means, uh, a, in, in a literal sense, um, a parceling of, of food, uh, especially, uh, or the grazing of grass for animals. But in the sense, in a prescriptive usage, in the form and the manner of prescription. Now, prescription, for instance, is that you are sick and you've gone to a hospital and the doctor gave you some drugs and prescribed how the drugs must be used. You know that many people have died uh, when misusing the, the drugs, not following the prescription that was given by the doctor. So the law is a form of prescription and that word also can be used as a regulation, regulation or principle. And I started earlier on by saying that every land, every family, every country has got, you know, um, prescription, has got um, principles that governs the land. And everybody that must abide successfully and peacefully in that land must submit himself or herself to the laws principled by the fathers of the land. To be that which will regularize the citizens and every occupant of that land. And so if you want to pioneer something different, you may have to be like Cain who left the presence of God and pioneered a different economy, pioneered a different civilization. He left the presence of God. So in Romans chapter 3 still, verses 27 and 28 says, And shall not uncircumcision, sorry, Romans chapter 3 verses 27, I read verse 27, Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Yeah, a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law because you've got nothing to contribute in the first place. In the stance wherein you are coming to Christ, you've got nothing to contribute. All you need to do is come unto me, all you that labor under heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So your coming is, is predicated on the faith of that invitation that Jesus has satisfied the demand for uh, divine, uh, di uh, I mean, um, justice. 
And so Jesus had fulfilled them. Jesus has satisfied that demand for divine justice. And so you are hinging your faith, having a consciousness that you have strayed away from God and that this work that Jesus did was what was needed or is what that is needed for you to return to God. And so when you came on that, you know, understanding, you are rightly standing with the Lord. That is the faith that grants you salvation. Now, every other thing after that place, my friend, is still a work of faith, rightly. Yeah. Your faith must produce the fruit. As we continue, uh, we will visit some scriptures. And so, here, you don't put the cart before the horse, for both shall at the end produce redundancy, but the horse must go before the cart. Both are as necessary as each other. Therefore, we cannot make void of or set aside the law for just having faith alone. You, you know, the faith and work are like the horse and the cart. The horse needs to drag the cart. And so if, if, if there must be a movement and not redundancy, then you must necessarily put the horse before the cart so that the, the, the cart will be driven by the horse. But if you put the horse behind the cart and set the cart front, you will have redundancy because the cart isn't going anywhere and the horse, if he's loyal, stays with you. And so what here means is that you cannot put work first. You cannot project work first and leave faith behind. No, you need faith first to achieve justification, to achieve you know, the freedom from the condemnation that sin brings. And then once this is done, faith drags along the work. Like I said earlier that our faith gives birth to our work of righteousness. And so in Romans chapter 3, verse 31, Apostle Paul said, do we then make void the law? Because when we read in verse 28, it says, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Somebody will ask me in there if we stop. You know, the problem with false teachers is that they pick certain areas of the Bible because their lives are, are bedeviled by certain things. Like one of the false teachers that is a popular pastor who says that you are a spirit, that man is a spirit, and so because you are a spirit, uh, God does not care what you do in your body, and so he tells you that, f that masturbation is not sin, that the only thing that, uh, that, is, that matters is what God calls uncleanness, and that uncleanness is when a man begins to sleep with a woman, or a woman begins to sleep with a, with a, with a woman, I mean, when a man begins to sleep with a man, sorry, when a man begins to sleep, that is homosexuality and lesbianism. And then, or when a, a man or woman begins to meet with animals, those are the ones he calls unclean, uncleanness. So it means that uh, he categorically put it that when you masturbate, that you are not committing sin because you are a spirit, your body is, is not God's business. But I read in my scripture, I think we should even go there first. I read in my scripture where the Bible says that you should do what? Present your body a living sacrifice unto God. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. Meanwhile, you are not a spirit. You are a man. You have a body. You have a soul. You have a spirit. Because the Bible in Job chapter 32, I think 32 verse 8 or 38 verse 12 says that there is a spirit in man and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. At no point in this world uh, have I ever seen that, that man is a spirit. There is no scripture that gives credence to that man is not a spirit but there is a spirit in man and so even if you have been told that you are a spirit now the truth is that you know you cannot live in sin 
and then uh, uh, claim to be a child of God because you claim to have faith. Faith that is empty. Faith that is without work is dead, being alone. Job chapter 32 verse 8 says, But there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. So, man is not a spirit. That is a little digression from what I'm talking about here. So, in Romans chapter 3 verse 31, Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. Because in any place where there is no law, lawlessness and carnage abounds. In Romans chapter 4, verse, verse, verse 1 says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what said the scriptures? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But the fact here now, you know, I'm trying to touch these scriptures, you know, tell you I'm not afraid to read them to you, as your first teachers may not be bold enough to read them to you, because they don't have an answer to the one that contradicts what they think. You know, their lives the way they live their lives is not right. And so they want, to, they want to make you believe that everything they do is okay. And so they don't want to burden your spirit with the consciousness of sin. Now, here, Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. That righteousness, that belief, spurred Abraham into doing things that other heathen you know, uh, 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 people wouldn't have done. It was his faith in God that made him to leave his home of 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 um, uh, ancestry. He left his ancestral home because of his faith in the Lord. Thus, we hereby say that the faith in Christ breeds the grace to fulfill the moral demands of the law that has been uh, printed on the tablets of our hearts. The faith in Christ produces the effect, there is the rippling effect that the faith in Christ, you know, automatically does. It quickens our conscience and our spirit comes alive. And so the fulfillment of the promise of God that he will write his laws on the tablets of our hearts that we don't need to, you know, be reminded again what is good and what is bad. It means that our conscience that will be, you know, we, we receive life. As in when you were born again, it was your spirit that got born again because it died when sin revived. It died. And so at, at, at salvation, the, when your faith was needed at the work that Jesus Christ did, your, your spirit came alive again. And so when this happened, there is the consciousness of the pleasing God that was, you know, um, inverted and printed on your heart. And so... I was reading and I was saying that we hereby say that the faith in Christ breeds the grace to fulfill the moral demands of the law that has been printed on the tablets of our heart. That we can as well see in Psalms chapter 40 verse 8. Psalms chapter 40 verse 8. Please bow with me. Let's just consider these scriptures and then uh, we call it a date. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Thy law is within my heart. Now, verse 9 is what your teacher, who is teaching you something different, will not, you know, that is the reason why he will not say this is because he doesn't have the testimony of this psalmist. He said, I have preached righteousness. In the great congregation, lo, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. Verse 10, I have not hid the righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. Because he doesn't have, verse 8, the law within his heart. And so he becomes lawless. Remember I said that any nation that is not governed by any regulation what you have is lawlessness. And that was what happened in the world of Nimrod. 
that the, he pioneered the rebellion against the will of God. And Nimrod happened to be you know, one of the descendants of rebellion. And in fact, that name Nimrod, um, scholars say that it means rebellion. And so, here, um, in, verse, in, in Psalm chapter uh, 40, verse 8, that we have ju just read, you see, the psalmist claims that the law of the Lord has been printed on his heart. And in Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19 to 20, and that says verses 26 to 28, but we, we limit our reading to 11 uh, verses 19 to 20, Ezekiel chapter 11, chapter 11, I read verses 19 to 20, says, And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh, and will give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes, and keep my ordinances, and do them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Now, the key word here is that, is that, he will take away the stony heart and will give them a new spirit. And he will give them a heart of flesh. Verse 20 says that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances. So the, the, the newness of the heart that God will pioneer in this his people, you know, stems from the faith that is expressed uh, in, the, in, the, you know, in the Son, at uh, the work of grace that the Son of God did in the cross of Calvary. So, um, uh, let's also look at, uh, there are several scriptures here. Hebrews chapter 8, we read verse 10. Hebrews chapter number 8, we read verse 10. It is important we understand, you know, we take notes as well that some of these things were written by the apostle, you know, um, the apostle Paul, apostle of faith. Uh, Verse 10, Hebrews chapter 10, we read chapter 8, verse 10, rather, chapter 8, verse 10. <laughs> it says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, say the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. So, this is the effect of faith. And so, when faith pioneers our salvation, now, it naturally, it triggers the aspect of work that grants us access to the heart of God. There are several scriptures. I mentioned Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26 to 28. Even the same Hebrews, I uh, think we should read that one as well, chapter 10, verse 16. It says in verse 16, This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. You see, once you come to the Lord Jesus a salvation. Your sins are written off. That is the justification. Now, like I said, works does not you know, go ahead of faith. Faith comes first, but there must be work following. And so when the scripture through the apostle says that nobody is justified by work, that is correct. You cannot get justification putting your work first. After all, there are many religious people who are doing good works but their good works is not in it. So once um, our faith in Jesus is expressed, the natural thing that happens is the fulfillment of this promise. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them by default. You see, this is like an application, your phone, for instance. You bought a phone and majority of us, we bought the phones just to say hello now but within that phone are other um, applications installed now one of the things that God does is that within the the confinement of your heart is a compartment that is housing you know a place for your for the word of God the those laws to be tabulated and you know, you know that um, sometimes you, when you open the phone, 
you discover that there are some applications that you needed, but by default did not come. But there is space. There is there is um, the 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 compliance ability of the phone to accept those things. And so, when you open your store, maybe your Play Store or or um, you know whichever you know phone you're using, if it is Android or you know iPhone. Now, if it is um, so uh, Apple Store, whichever whatever they, they call it. Now, when you open the store, you look at the application you need, you, you download and set it in motion, it begins to work. So also, within the confinement of your heart, there is the, the, uh, the, the compartment that is receptible to the laws of God naturally being printed at the tables that God has created there for himself. Because from the origin of your being a man, those things were there, but sin came and silenced them. And so when you give your life to Jesus and you express your faith in Jesus, those things are activated naturally. And so what happens is that we can either ignore them, ignore this, the voice. We can either uh, refuse to acknowledge when they speak or by faith activate them and put them in, in place just like you can open your phone menu and not every application you put to work at the same time when you open you know every one of them will be giving you an invite now you chose the one that you want to uh, uh, put at work and so several times several things appeals to your heart but the application that is there which can only work with the faith that is in Christ Jesus is there. You know, you it is you now that will put it to work. Amen. So we see in Romans chapter 4, verse 1 to 4, that the faith of Abraham was perfected by his works. I've said this before, for such was the testimony of God of him when the Lord said, Now I know. If Abraham did not work, if Abraham did not do anything physical that that God saw. That testimony of God of him, now I know, wouldn't have come. So he believed God. He acted on his faith. He had faith in God. And when God said, give your son Isaac, he gave. And the Lord looked on him and said, now I know. Abraham believed that God was going to provide himself a ram for the sacrifice. But not until he killed his son. And that was acting on his faith. If you want to, you know, uh, read more about, you know, the, the, the promise of God to plant his word in us, you can also look at Jeremiah chapter 32, read verses 39 and 40. And um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 3 to 6, I think we should vis visit that. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we read verses 3 to 6. And I read verse 3 to 6, 1 Corinthians for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am not sorry, this should be Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians, I hope I'm correct. Hope I'm correct. Second Corinthians chapter 3. Verse uh, from verse 3. For as much as ye are manifestly declared. To be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in the tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to God word, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiencies of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. For as much as he are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. So the, the faith in Christ Jesus now will make you that you will be so um, uh, adapted to the letters of the law. Because the Spirit will give life to your spirit to, by default, live according to these things. But when we fail to live it, it comes up in judgment and we stand against you. That is why the Bible said that the letter kill it, but the Spirit give it life. Now, if you don't have the justification that was provided, you know, 
by Christ, when you manifested your faith in him, then you want to depend on the work. This is where it kills. This is where they do not, do not, do not, do not, do not, that you, you find in the Old Testament becomes deadly. But with faith in Christ Jesus, now nah, it means that you can actually activate that part of you that will so much want to align with God. And so, when the Bible said, now I know, the Lord said, now I know, it was the climax of the fruit of his faith in the living God. This was the climax of the faith of Abraham in the living God, thereby his ergon gave credence to his pistis, his work. Now give credence, give validity, give proof to the fact that he had faith in God. Okay? These two operate like the gun and the pistol. I mean, and the trigger. The pistol and the trigger. Without the trigger, the gun is useless. Without the engine, your vehicle is useless. Without, without, without uh, your spirit in you, for instance, the flesh is useless. And so, faith and work can never be separated. Where there is no law, I said this before, lawlessness abounds. And that we see in Romans chapter 4, verse 15. So there is no way the Almighty God will leave us lawless. There's no way He will leave us uh, bereft of regulation. The regulations are there, and it is those that don't want to abide by, by its you know, regulation that wants to put forth this falsehood that you can only have faith in Christ and don't you know, uh, look at your life. Because in verse 15 of Romans chapter 4, because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Of course, where there is no law, you cannot say anybody has offended. Where there is no law, anybody can kill anybody. He has not broken any law. Where there is no law, you know, people can, can curse, you know, uh, uh, carnage. And yet, nobody prosecutes anybody because you don't have the law. But once these sins are tabulated and called into you know, law, if you break any of those laws, then you will be called for questioning. If you attack anybody violently or however, you will be called for questioning because you have broken a law. So, where there is no law, it, you know, lawlessness abounds. Meanwhile, if grace and faith nullify work, then our Lord summon on the mount would have been, you know, a wasted time. If grace and faith, you know, uh, has nullified or have nullified law and work. Now, why didn't you, Jesus, take the whole time he took Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. Why should those, that long sermon be there? You know, for uh, uh, in Romans chapter 6 verses 1 and 2, the Bible says uh, uh, chapter 6 verse 1 and 2, I will read it to you. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So you are saved and you want to continue your sin because works does not save. It is faith that saved. And so your faith is, is, is so porous. Your faith is so conscienceless that you can claim to be of Jesus. And then you commit fornication. And they will still mount the podium and speak in tongues. You will commit adultery. And then you will still mount the podium and speak in tongues. You will commit fornication and then you will still sing in the choir. You still stand as an usher. You will, you will, you, you know, you will commit masturbation and fantasize all kinds of dirty things within your heart. And we still stand to lift your, when we say lift up your holy hands, the hand that already you, you used to defile yourself, you lift it up to wish God. No, it's not unto God. It's not unto God. The Bible says, Shall we continue in sin then, so that grace should much more abound? 
the apostle here said, God forbid. My brother, my sister, there is no other apostle that you want to quote for me that says that, that uh, you know, we are not justified by works but by faith. It is this same apostle Paul. But I have told you here that justification by faith means that you don't put your work first. For your work cannot get you anywhere before God. It is the faith in the finished work of cross, the finished work of, of Christ on the cross. Now, when your faith is, is on this, God sees it and he activates, you know, the, the justification. It's just like an automated thing that once your faith is expressed in Christ, you are admitted into the family of God. But you cannot come from a country where there is, is lawlessness, where there is evil, where there is impunity. And you come into this organized kingdom of God, whereas the Bible said even in the house of God that everything should be set in order. How then can you think that in the kingdom of God that there shall be no order? For where there is no law, there is no orderliness. Where there is no law, there is no orderliness. Verse 6 says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that, that henceforth we should not do what? Serve sin. Verse 7, For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we also shall live with him. If we be dead with Christ, I am alive, but I'm dead with Christ. That is the faith. And so once I am dead with Christ, things will begin to manifest in me that I am I will be numbed to the the the, the, the deliverable of the devil, uh, the things he will come to market, uh, you know, the things he will come to advertise, you know, the flesh will come to that point where it has been silenced. So this is where the release of our faith reflects into the manifestation of our works of righteousness, which is the fruit that, that was so important to become the identifier of true believers. Jesus our Lord said that, that by their fruit you shall know them. So the fruit, this work is so important to Jesus that our work, which is translated to fruit, was so important to him that he, the work now, our work, our, that which we manifest. Faith is a thing of the heart. It is not sin. Faith is soft copy. But your work is the hard copy of your relationship with God. Yes. Your faith is a soft copy. But your work is the hard copy, the ones that people see. So the Lord Jesus says that this hard copy becomes the identifier of the true believers in Christ Jesus. And hence he said, by their fruit, you shall know them. So if faith excludes work, as some say, then what fruit is the Lord alluding to? And that in Matthew chapter 7, verses 16, we will read to 20. I am rounding off now because the video is already very, very long. Matthew chapter 7, I read from verse 16. And there the Bible says, Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth a good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, ye by their fruits ye shall know them. I think I should leave you to be the judge of this place. If a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, how can you claim to have Jesus in you? Because the Bible where we read said that the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is liberty from sin. There is liberty. There is freedom from all kinds of wickedness and unrighteousness. And so, if the Lord is that spirit, the Bible says that a good tree, uh, I think I, I, sh I should take that place again. Even so, every good tree, verse 17, bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. It will be an error for me to claim to be of Jesus. Jesus is not a minister of sin. Jesus is not a pioneer of unrighteousness. So if the spirit of the Lord is in me, for he is that spirit, and then out of me comes all kinds of unrighteousness, all kinds of wickedness, all kinds of evil, then I am contradicting the work of the master. 
So a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree now, now this is the consequence, that bringeth not forth good fruit. The consequence is that this tree shall be hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Now, as I round off, um, I'd like you to understand that if you are a Christian and you have faith in Christ Jesus, that guarantees your salvation, that gives you justification. But stopping at that alone does not guarantee your eternal salvation. It does not guarantee your life in eternity. You must match your faith with work. Uh, there are other aspects to this teaching, but I guess I will have to stop it here now. So I will, uh, like I said earlier, if I have good viewership or no, um, you know, that encourages, now we will go on to talk about how do we work, work in faith, W-A-L-K, in faith, and work, W-O-R-K, in faith. Now, then we are going to consider, you know, three points that can help and enhance our work with the Lord. So I will be putting it off here. Um, you know, the video is almost uh, more than an hour and I didn't intend to make it that long. So I'll be seeing you in the next video. Please, I plead with you, child of God, share this video, like it, um, send it to people. S send it to people that you think needs, need to hear this and uh, encourage them to to view it and like and put down their comments as well put down your comments I want to acknowledge ahead of time there are those that will disagree with, with what I'm saying it is fine it is okay put down your comments and whatever you want to put down back it with scriptures and if the Lord permits we can also look at it if it is worth a response we will respond to it God bless you and keep you rapturable in the name of Jesus I wish that you bear good fruit that is commensurable to the faith that you have in Christ Jesus. Till I come your way again, Shalom.